uh, which is sponsored by the ACS Division of Analytical Chemistry. Um, the symposium is entitled Advances in Our Understanding of Complex Aerosols at the Individual Particle Level. So there's a couple of themes that will come about from this symposium. Uh, one is that atmospheric aerosols are complex um, and their identity is sometimes hard to uh, determine and studying them uh, requires uh, techniques and methods uh, that uh, where you use uh, single particle measurements. Um, oftentimes that's truly the only way you can really tell what's going on uh, in terms of understanding uh, the, the chemistry of atmospheric aerosols. So today we're going to focus on, on recent advances in the measurement and understanding of the composition of these aerosols using these single particle techniques. And what you'll see from the different speakers is that everybody uh, uses somewhat slightly different types of uh, single particle measurements to try to understand this very uh, complex system. And I'll turn uh, the introduction over to uh, the uh, Kim Prather, um, who's uh, presiding with me today. My name is Vicki Grassian from the University of Iowa. Uh, She's from the University of California, San Diego, who will show you in a few slides how truly how complex some of these aerosols are. Okay, um, good morning everybody and thank you for um, coming to this session. Um, Vicki Vicky is nicely introduced. I'll just give, feedback. Pull away. Okay, I'll just give uh, a bit of background on, on atmospheric aerosols and sort of the motivation behind. I think the theme that you'll see in a lot of the talks today are some of the, some of the challenges that, ah, some of the challenges. <laughs> <laughs> some of the challenges we face, some of the challenges we face in sort of doing this analysis, and I think this is really exciting to be at this conference because there's all kinds of new tools that are being developed, and I think there's a lot of room um, for some creativity and innovation in this area. But just briefly, the kinds of things we think about when we, we talk about atmospheric aerosols and what's really out there, the one that you're going to hear a lot about today is sea spray. Um, this is the aerosol type that sort of blankets our, our globe. The, Oceans cover 71% of our Earth, so um, this is a very, very important aerosol. Another aerosol that you hear a lot about, and we, both Vicki and I have, have worked in this quite a bit, and that's how we got to know each other, and you'll hear from Vicki something about the dust um, that, that blankets the globe. And the thing I've come to appreciate um, in our field studies is that globe, that dust is sort of everywhere all the time. Um, basically, it's just, it's a surface that's out there that's modifying our atmosphere in some unknown, almost unknown way. Um, and so you'll hear more about sort of how do you deal with the fact that you have, in this case, just two very different, chemically different surfaces. This is a really neat, surf this is what brought me into it. This is a really neat surface chemistry problem. And so how do we probe those surfaces, the complexity of those surfaces, and then learn something more about um, the processes that are happening? But then we can't forget humans. Um, we also have the human contributions, which are largely um, from combustion processes. And so these are just some of the sources that are producing the most, uh, most of the aerosols that are out there, um, let alone the fact that once these things get into the atmosphere, they undergo many, many reactions. Um, these are condensed phase uh, particles, and so you can have things evaporating and, and condensing on the particles continuously. Their, their spatial distribution compared to other pollutants we think about, especially for, from a climate perspective, like CO2. CO2, if we measure it in two different points, we get roughly the same answer, whereas aerosols, I mean, across this room, we probably would see a gradient in difference in the composition. So this is the challenges we face, is how do we address the chemical complexity, the fact that the chemistry is changing all the time, and we'll, we'll go through, I'll go through some other ch challenges that we also face as I go into my talk. And so I think I'm going to switch over to mine. She's going to start and make sure I don't run over um, on mine. She's tough. She's a tough co-chair. Okay. Oops. I forgot I had one more slide that I'll just quickly say. I was, basically, this is this slide just sends the message that aerosols are very are pretty much everywhere. Um, again, I've done 22 years of field studies where we go out and we try to f isolate a specific type of particle from a specific source. You can't do that anymore. Aerosols blanket the globe. 
Based, we've shown now that aerosols from Af as far away as Africa can be to California in about seven days. And so, you know, this is just a constant mixing. The atmosphere has no walls. And so trying to unravel what leads to these, this haze in these different, different regions is a, is a major challenge that we're all very concerned with trying to address. Okay. Going? All right, it's going. It says, it says talk. Okay. All right, so um, that brings me to um, the subject of, of my talk, which I'm going to focus on a new center that we start, we've started at UC San Diego. Um, also, there's a number of other institutions. The University of Iowa, with Vicki being the co-director, is another part of it, as well as um, a number of other institutions. Um, and basically, the goal of this, this center is to try and go after this issue of chemical complexity. But in particular, as you build chemical complexity, how does this impact uh, climate change? And so um, we've developed a novel approach, as I'll, I'll discuss, which has to do with, which has to do with but basically trying to simulate um, the conditions of the real world in the laboratory. And so today I'll walk you through how we've been doing that and the things that we've been learning as we go along. This is the Center for Chemical Innovation from the National Science Foundation. It started October 1st. We're in phase two. So it's five years for $20 million to go after this grand challenge. All right, so just an overview, you know, the big push in our center is to try and really understand the climate impacts of aerosols. Um, as I'll show in a minute, our lack of understanding, in particular of the chemistry impacts um, of aerosols on climate represents one of the largest, under, the largest uh, uncertainties in our understanding of climate change. Aerosols impact many things besides climate. Um, air quality, as I showed you in the slide, where there's just sort of visual, visual um, cues that aerosols are pretty much everywhere. Human health, um, regional and global climate, as I'll describe, as well as water resources, which I'll, I'll cover um, too. So what I'm going to talk about, the bulk of my talk today is going to be this new approach that we've come up with for sort of looking at um, the complexity of real world aerosols, but in a laboratory, a laboratory setting. And the motivation behind developing this brand new approach is the fact that, as I mentioned, I've done over 20 years of field studies. And these are, while, while these are very revealing, we go out, we measure something, we see change, and we try our best to sort of understand that at a fundamental level so that we can basically figure out what we need to maybe remove from the atmosphere to not, not cause that, that problem anymore. But we, we really don't get to that level of understanding. And we, we go back out to the same site, we measure something entirely different, something else changes. And with so many variables in the real world, we can never really under, completely nail down what leads to a specific change. So then your other option is to go to the lab and try and model these systems. In the case of gas phase you know, reactions and kinetics, you've got a molecule. You take it into the lab and you can do a very careful study of how those molecules work. Another example is a stratospheric ozone hole, another huge environmental problem that we faced. There, you know, it was the stratosphere. The chemistry problem was relatively simple. Even though it was heterogeneous chemistry that was shown to be important, just trying to go back to the lab and mimic stratos stratospheric, the polar stratospheric clouds, they could do that. And so Mario Molina, who's a big part of our center, you know, basically himself said, that problem on a chemistry from a chemistry perspective was relatively easy. So, but for the troposphere where there's you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of different compounds, all in different proportions in particles, you know, how are we ever going to um, simulate that in the lab and, and properly at a level that allows us to say, to explain our field observations? The bottom line is we haven't really been able to do that and we believe that's a big roadblock in where we're trying to go. So just sort of background on how aerosols impact climate, we all know a lot more, in general, the public knows a lot more about things like CO2, um, which, is, which leads to heating. But aerosols have a couple of ways that they can, they can affect climate. One is just their direct interaction with sunlight. They, can, they basically scatter light very effectively. They're just individual particles, but depending on the refractive indices, they can reflect light. But they, if they're made of things like soot, the combustion aerosols I showed, or what people are calling now brown carbon because it's absorbing carbon, that will absorb the sunlight and lead to heating just like CO2. So chemistry becomes really, really important in trying to understand how much aerosols are warming or cooling our atmosphere. On average, we believe that they are leading to an overall cooling. They reflect a lot of light back to space, but there's a huge amount of uncertainty in our understanding of that. The other way, and this is a big, huge focus of our center, is how aerosols seed clouds. Clouds blanket 
on average about two-thirds the surface of our Earth at any time. And at the center of every cloud drop, at the center of every ice crystal, is a particle. And so basically what we're trying to understand is which particles form clouds. And this is a huge question. In chemistry, ultimately, size is important. But when you get down into certain size ranges, basically small sizes, chemistry becomes the dominant player. So for CCN, cloud condensation nuclei, which water condense upon, you want soluble species. In contrast, for ice nuclei, you want insoluble. Usually, we think they're insoluble. So something that basically can form lattice structure, match the lattice structure of water and form ice. It's the holy grail, really, in trying to understand um, climate and precipitation processes, because ice is very, very important precipitation. And today, you'll hear from Alan Bertram more about their search to try and um, understand what forms ice and clouds, but that's one of the, the largest uncertainties we face. So we know that aerosols offset some amount of the warming induced by greenhouse gases. Again, that uncertainty is relatively large. They can warm or cool our planet. They can affect precipitation processes, and now we're finding that they can really even impact these extreme weather events. They can basically enhance precipitation just enough to where you can go from having sort of a normal amount of water coming out of a cloud to extreme amounts of water coming out where you get flooding. So it's, they're really, really a concern in that regard. And their impact on clouds represents the single largest uncertainty in our understanding of climate change. So this just shows basically a figure that's been shown many times in the aerosol community, but in, in the climate community, this black line shows whether things warm or cool our planet. And so you can see all the greenhouse gases are up here, and to, they're going to the right, which leads to what we call radiative forcing. Positive radiative forcing is warming. So all the greenhouse gases, we have a pretty, you know, pretty good handle on where they are. The uncertainties are relatively small. But when we come down to aerosols, which I've boxed in here, the two effects that I talked about, you can see that we believe they're cooling. On average, they go left, and they have a negative radiative forcing. But look at the sizes of the uncertainties. And so if you just look right down to our total impact of human in activities on climate, we don't really, we have a huge uncertainty on how much things are changing. And this is why when you hear reports of what the temperatures are going to be at the end of the century, you see such a broad range. We're either in trouble or a lot of trouble. And to come up with policies that will offset the things that we're putting into the atmosphere in a way that's productive, we need to really narrow these uncertainties down. And what we would argue is that because most of the uncertainties come from aerosols, this is the area where we really, really, really need to improve climate models. So we work closely with climate modelers in the center, um, trying to give them better treatment of aerosols. Right now, just to calibrate you, the surface of particles is sort of treated, you know, dust, as Vicki will talk about, sort of dust is dust. It doesn't matter what the mineralogy is. Sea salt is sea salt. Sea spray is sea salt. It's all salty. And so the models have to treat things very chemically simplistically in order to, to put them in, in all. And so the modelers are a little nervous with chemists coming into this problem, quite honestly, because um, you know, there's, there's a lot of you know, potential cans of worms. And so what we're trying to do is figure out when does chemistry matter? When can you not ignore it in the models? Okay, we're not going to try and put every single detail of what we're, we're learning in the center, but we're going to try and say when are they the most important and what is dictating the climate impacts of these aerosols. So just a little bit of background. I mentioned the, those are the global impacts, but one of the, one of the sort of, when you think about it from the standpoint of, of climate, there's also regional climate. And this is work we published last year in science um, where we went out. And so I mentioned I do field studies, and this is the only thing I'll talk about in field studies. It kind of sets the stage for why we're now taking a center approach. This is the Sierra Nevadas in California where we store all of our snow. Um, and so basically we went out and we fly through clouds. And with our instruments that I'll talk about, we can measure the chemistry of every cloud droplet and every ice crystal, one by one. And we can link it back to the source. So our big question is, what seeds clouds? And so when we did that, we were going out, we were looking actually for pollution to be in these clouds. And if you get too much pollution in a cloud, you can actually shut down precipitation. So in areas where humans are, the amount of precipitation that's coming down is much, much less. And that's what we were looking for. But instead, and this was 2011, we found out that there was like this, this sort of these high-level clouds that when we flew through them, we found dust and biological aerosols 
um, that were, is, it turns out, transported from as far away as Africa, these would give you the magical ice that I mentioned. So once you have ice, it's like a switch. The ice sucks the water away from all the, the liquid droplets, becomes huge, falls through the clouds, scavenges the droplets in the clouds below, and we, every time we saw this, there was copious amounts of snow at the ground. And so what we were able to show is that dust from as far away as, from Africa was changing the precipitation over California. And this was a big surprise. And so, you know, again, from field observations, we kind of know in general it's dust and biological particles. We don't know where those bioparticles are coming from. And that's a big piece of case is to try, our center is to try and understand what those are. And now, in fact, dust, or dust particles, weather forecast models are starting to include aerosol chemistry. And this is a big step forward. And so the problem is, is that we kind of know this general switch is there, but we don't really know the details of why, the, what the chemically led to this significant change. And so this is a place where you have a field observation, but now we want to go back to the lab and try and understand things. So in case the mission statement is basically to transform our ability to accurately predict the impact of aerosols on climate and our environment by bringing real world chemical complexity into the laboratory. So that's our challenge. Can we actually bring the, all of the complexity of the real world into the lab where we can actually control things? We can turn one knob and see one change, like chemists like to do. And so versus the atmosphere, you know, sort of we take what we get and we try to measure everything. In the lab, we can actually have more control. That's our hope. And so the system that we're looking at is, I mentioned the ocean, that's where we're starting. And there's been a lot of work done on sort of model systems. We know there's a lot of sodium chloride coming out of the ocean. But what we assume is that every particle that comes out of the ocean looks the same. In fact, if you measure the chemistry of single particles, as we'll talk about today, you can see that there are quite a, there's quite a bit of diversity. And if you care about things like cloud formation, their optical properties, their, how they react, this picture is going to give you a very different answer from this picture, which is what the models use. And so we're really trying to understand. One of the qu critical questions is, is there some small part of the population, maybe only 10% are actively involved in driving everything? And so that's the kinds of changes that we're looking for. The system that we're trying to simulate is very complex in the lab, where you've got you know, basically exchange of gases and aerosols, and you're looking sort of at the chemistry that comes out. So one of the big questions, believe it or not, that's sort of a simple question is, how does the changes in seawater composition change the control, I should say, the chemistry of the aerosols. No one's ever figured that out. And so we know the ocean chemistry changes largely through biological processes, but how, do we, how does that get reflected in the aerosol phase? Because we know that in areas of the ocean that are, have high biological activity, we see the clouds change. We've seen this for decades, many, many decades, but we don't know really why. And, we, and so that's one of the things that we're trying to sort out. So can we do this? Can we reproduce this? This was phase one. This was the first three years of the center, was try to simulate this system in the lab. So this is the way that people tr typically create um, control um, sea spray, they put uh, fritz, like you put in your aquarium, that produce lots of bubbles, tiny bubbles. And those tiny bubbles burst and produce lots of sea spray. So this produces copious amounts of sea spray. But the thing is, is that, as I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about, if you don't produce, and this is something we've had to, as part of the center, we have oceanographers we're working with. That's one of the beauties of having the center. If you don't produce these bubbles correctly, your sea spray will be some fictitious surface. It's not going to look anything like the sea spray that comes out of the ocean. So what we did was we worked with the oceanographers to make controlled breaking waves, which give us the same bubble size distribution as in the ocean. And then we looked at the sea spray. And, and I can tell you that it is, it is quite different. The size and the composition of the particles produced by these two different processes is completely different. So basically, this is sort of the gold standard. And then we produced a technique, which I'll show you a little bit about, which basically uses a waterfall and produces in a smaller tank, looks like a fish tank, and produces a lot of sea spray as well with a very similar composition. So this is, this is the facility that we used in phase one. Um, it has a paddle back here, which goes and sends a packet, a focused wave packet, which breaks in a place that we know exactly where that is. These are all the instruments that we were using during a major study in November of 2011, once we had the sea spray. It took us 15 months 
to produce the sea spray properly and know that we had exactly what's coming out of the ocean. So it was not simple. So once we did that, everybody knew we had sea spray. People came from everywhere to measure our, our, our messy sea spray. People who've been doing studies over the ocean for years wanted to know how different things looked. And so we did this huge study in this in what's called the what we call the Case Ocean Atmosphere Facility. And so we measured all the seawater parameters as well as the aerosols and gas phase species. And you'll hear more about this today. So this is just a fisheye view of that same channel, but this is a breaking wave and how it looks. And then the neat thing is that we can actually pump natural seawater into, into this channel and we can cap it off and then we can control the biology. And that really is what gives us the knob for tuning the chemistry as I'll talk about. So using this system, we published our first, a huge paper in PNAS. It had, I don't know, close to 40 co-authors, um, you know, all the way from, you know, physical oceanographers, marine biologists, and a lot of chemists. And we were able to show that sea spray is much more than just sea salt. There's many types that come out of this in this spray. And so now the next question is, what are those? And you'll, you'll hear more about that throughout the day. So this is, when I say we did a knob, so you have to get the physical part right. First step, physical production. Once you've got that, then now how are we gonna control the chemistry and look for changes? And so what we did was rather than, I should say, step back, what, what a lot of people do is they will take algae, and we did this too. They'll, make, they'll grow algae, or they'll grow a lot of bacteria, and they'll dump them in the channel, and then they'll look for a change. But we, just, we, we did that, but that turned out to be really hard to sort of unravel what was going on. So instead what we did is we just took natural seawater, we spiked it with nutrients, just like dust in the ocean, just like a phytoplankton bloom occurs. And when you do that, phytoplankton begins, this is our sort of a conceptual cartoon of what we expect to happen, but this is actually what happens. Phytoplankton grow in. Phytoplankton are a food for bacteria. So shortly thereafter, marine bacteria grow in. They are the food for viruses. Shortly thereafter, viruses grow in. These different types of microorganisms will actually lead to very different chemistry. And so here we start with relatively, you know, very natural seawater, which is still pretty messy, but we build the complexity as this bloom evolves. And so then we measure the sea spray composition and the climate effects and reactivity of these aerosols as they're produced. So just the question is, you know, as we do these changes, do we see changes in climate? What is controlling the different climate properties? We can mimic cloud formation in the lab, both the liquid clouds and the ice clouds. So we have those instruments going as well. So this is the tank that we developed. It's called a MART tank. But basically, it looks like a, it looks like a fancy aquarium. But when we get a bloom, you can see that a lot of things change. So we spike it. And just to show you, the it turns out that the waterfall is not a simple thing. Let's see if we can get this to work. Um, bah, bah, bah. No, it's okay. I just have to get my mouse. Oh, maybe I won't. Oh, shoot. Ah. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> I keep going too far. I'm overcorrecting. Where are you going over there? Uh-oh. Maybe this was not a good idea. Let me see if I just said okay. Oh, maybe I'm just not going to show you the movie. No, I think I'm just not going to show you the movie. Okay, I'll explain how it works. Basically, there's a waterfall that plunges down into the tank and creates the right bubble size distribution to produce the sea spray, and then we just sample off the top. But the waterfall, the trick is that you can only turn it on for four seconds, and then you wait, and you let it dissipate. You know, when you see waves break, you see all this foam, and then you see it dissipate. The foam is everything, and again, foam is chemistry. And so this, the, basically, we would turn it on, plunge for four seconds, let it dissipate, turn it on, plunge for four seconds, dissipate. The other interesting thing is, is that the critters don't like this process. So what we have to do is spike the tank. We had to learn the hard way. We had to spike the tank and wait. Let them get some momentum. Wait days before they have, so they build up momentum. Because we found that if we turned on the plunging and started sampling right away, we killed them. And so basically, over the last year and a half, we figured out how to replicate this process over and over and over. We can time it when these blooms are going to happen. And this has been a huge accomplishment as part of the center. And now we're, trying, we're in position to try and understand what these changes are. To give you a feel of the complexity of the biology in seawater, this is from one of our collaborators, Farouk Azam's group. He's been studying marine bacteria for years. This is the, the question is, as you have these, all these different particles in seawater and different chemistries in seawater, what actually gets translated out into the particle phase, into the aerosols? And so if we look at the single particles produced in sea spray, right away you see it's not a bunch of homogeneous little sodium chloride cubes. It's actually highly complex. 
And so the question is, what are the compositions of all these different particles? So the technique that we've developed in my group many years ago is an online mass spectrometer that looks at the chemistry of single particles. We measure size by measuring their speed, and then we blast the particles apart and measure the composition, both positive ions and negative ions, from every particle one by one. And so what we end up with is a number of fractions of the different types. A lot of other research you focus, focuses on collecting a bulk sample and averaging everything together and getting a composition, a mass con composition. But clouds really don't care about this picture. They do care about this one. And so we really are looking at number fraction. As a whole in the center, we're treating these individual particles, each one very differently. So to give you sort of a flavor, if we were to take a bulk perspective, if we were to just take all of the peaks that were in the sea spray we saw, and I'm just looking sort of at the top 20 different signatures and blending them together here to make a point. But these are all sort of the main peaks that stand out at you. And so what do you learn about the complexity of the aerosols from this picture? Not much. If we go a little step further, these are actually, each one of those is a different pattern. When we analyze the chemistry of single particles, we get a different pattern. So I've color coded the different ones. It's still, it's a little questionable what you can learn when you combine everything together as you normally do when we average things. But we, can't, we don't have to do that. We actually have the different fingerprints. And th there are, I don't know, at least 50 different fingerprints that we see, but these are the dominant ones. And what you see immediately, this is kind of what you would expect, sodium chloride. This is the top type that we see until biology kicks in and then it starts to change quite a bit. But even the ions are changing the relative proportions of the ions, the sodium relative, some of them have more magnesium. It's not just like the composition of seawater where you take, seawater has a certain proportion of sodium to magnesium and that's what you get. It's not that. If you average these two together, you get it back. But if you look at it this way, you see that there's a huge diversity in chemistry. So if we look at the types of particles that we see, just sea salt, the top two sea salt types, there's this type which is a beautiful cube, which is sodium chloride enriched. And then there's one that's got a lot more organic material, which is what we see as the blooms evolve. So you lose this beautiful sort of um, cubic sodium chloride structure and you start to see these morph morphed com compounds. And, so, and if you go further and look at sort of the details of the different ions, you see there's actually a ring of magnesium around the outside. So in the, in the sake of complexity, where we've actually now have you know, so many different compounds mixing, we're starting to see hints that there's phase changes going on in these particles, which is, from a chemistry perspective, isn't that surprising. From an, from an aerosol perspective, it is a bit surprising. So other ways that we look at things, we're developing new tools for looking at single particles or using older tools to try and tackle this problem. We can put um, plates in and freeze them and do cryotransmission electron microscopy and surprises start to appear, big surprises. This is looking at images in the sea surface microlayer. We start to see vesicles forming. We can see vesicles inside of vesicles, lam in these multilaminar vesicles. These are, these, were, these are very, very small. They're down around the 100 nanometer scale. And these structures are being formed by the biological components being ejected from these different, um, these different microorganisms. This is a bacterium. Sometimes you can see little circles, which is their food supply. These are diatoms with their little tails. And so these are being enriched in the sea surface microlayer. Then when the waves crash, the bubbles plunge, these get launched into the aerosol phase. So next time you walk on the beach or go surfing, you can think of these critters that you're breathing. Um, but the big question is, you know, stepping back, we have control of what's going on in the biology. There's this enrichment that happens at this interface. There's an enrichment that happens at the bubble interfaces. And the question is, by the time you go through all these different interfaces, you end up with aerosols, which also have an interface. So what we're finding is, at the inter by the time you get to the interface of the aerosol, you have this huge enrichment along the way. And when we look at the aerosols that are getting out, these are actually little clumped together vesicles in the aerosol phase by cryo-EM. So again, we see a very a, a lar lot of these different um, structures that are getting out that are somewhat surprising, although many years ago, um, Barney Ellison, uh, Veronica Vida, and Adrian Tuck proposed this sort of potential structure of, of, um, that could be forming from these lipids and things that are present in the, in the seawater. So we're wondering if these are the hints. But now we're going after this at a molecular level, as, as chemists do. So we're going to try and figure out what the contents of these different um, particles are.
So just quickly, just the implications for this, um, this type of finding on the atmosphere. We see these things. We see these characteristic signatures. We can control them now. We, we feel pretty confident that we're able, that the particles that we see over the, in our wavelength look very much like the ones outside, although the ones outside have undergone a lot more transformations. That's going to be the next step, is to build a smog chamber that allows us to look at those changes. But in the meantime, this is work that was covered um, by our group um, on the work we, some of our work we obtained flying through clouds, where we got very characteristic signatures as we flew through clouds that looked bio-like. And so um, this was, uh, as I say, the focus of this was sort of we showed that bioparticles appeared to be very important in ice formation in clouds. And so this was a, if people are interested, it was published a couple of years ago in Discover Magazine. And so these, this is just a bubble. We can actually look. And when bubbles rise, it's been shown before that bacteria should be getting out with a high enrichment factor, like an enrichment factor that's like 10,000 over the concentration it was in the, in the water because they are hydrophobic. They don't really like to be in that water, so they get out. So just to show you, I don't have the peaks labeled, but this is a mass spectrum we acquired flying through a cloud in the ice phase. And on top of it is, the, is a mass spectrum of bacteria, marine bacteria from the wave flume. And you, can, you really can't tell there are two um, things there. And so this is what we would term a perfect match. And so if you look at the implications of that, we measured ice, Paul Dumont measured ice nuclei, actually with Alan Bertram, measured ice nuclei concentrations versus the concentration of these heterotrophic bacteria in our wave flume, and we got a really nice correlation. So it's some, it, we don't know at this point if it's the bacteria themselves or something they're producing or doing in the seawater. But it's bacteria, we, to be safe, we call it bacteria related. And so we're, we really were excited to see this match between our our lab studies and, and actually what we find in the clouds. We had been seeing the signature in the clouds forever, and we were calling it salty, dusty bio. We had no idea, but it now it looks like marine bacteria are very important. So with that, um, you know, basically, We've, we've developed this ocean atmosphere wave system. We're really just at the beginning in terms of answering questions about complex chemistry. I think one of the things we've been able to appreciate is if you tried to do this in the lab as a model system, you know, you'd be buying a lot of different chemicals and trying to figure out exactly what proportion to put them in. And what, instead what we did was we stepped back and are allowing the critters and the microorganisms to make these compounds for us, just like they do in the real world. And so we're able to do that because of the center approach, where we have marine biologists telling us not, not to mess up. We would have done it completely differently without their input. Same with the physical oceanographers. We were generating sea spray the wrong way, the way that most atmospheric chemists generate sea spray. We would have gotten an answer. We would have measured changes, but we would never have been able to use those observations to explain the real world. And now I think we're at the point where we can really start making these connections. People don't even know how much sea spray comes out of the ocean, believe it or not. The amount that people pr predict in models varies by seven orders of magnitude depending on which model you use. And so we don't know how much gets out. We believe chemistry is one of the big key players in controlling how much gets out. It's really interesting, I mentioned the bubbles. We know the bubble sizes because we can listen to them pop. If you change the composition of the seawater, you add a little more magnesium, their sound changes. You can completely change the production of the sea spray by changing the chemistry of the seawater. So, the physical oceanographers are shocked. You know, they figured it was just pure physical production mechanisms and chemistry wouldn't really, it'd be like a minor player. It looks like chemistry is dictating, in particular organic chemistry, is dictating these processes. So getting this production mechanism has really made us appreciate how important chemistry and production mechanism go hand in hand and you've got to get both right to do it, to get the right answer. Seawater biology also, as I mentioned, plays a role. We've learned very quickly that the composition of the seawater is not what the single particles look like. Instead, things are really distributed largely through different interplay between these, comp these compounds. We see huge differences. So here we feel all proud that we can measure single particles one by one, but that's not enough. It's the interface that matters. So as part of the center, we're going to be pushing tools that allow us to make measurements at the interface without a vacuum, ideally, and can get at this complexity problem. So as I say, if there's people with tools that, in this area, you know, please talk to us, because this is an area that has a great, great need. Marine bacteria turn out to play, be a really important player. Before our studies, people really focused on phytoplankton, something you can see easily from space, the chlorophyll. 
Um, but we find that the changes aren't happening when the phytoplankton are there as much as you have to wait. And so this is something that will help people in field studies maybe, maybe guide them better where they park their ship and for how long. So the mesocosm approach has really paid off and now we're starting to do a lot of imaging of all these different components and seeing what actually gets out into the aerosol phase and how these different, the chemical biology in the seawater changes the structures of these different particles. And so with that, I'd like to acknowledge um, those that um, did the work. This is a small collection of the work I actually talked about today, the postdocs and students in case. It's an incredible team. Also the investigators, which is a, a compilation of a number of people um, across UC San Diego and um, University of Iowa. And then Paul DeMont, who's been side by side with us for all of our ice nucleation work. And finally, last but not least, I'll thank them again, the National Science Foundation for funding our center and you for your attention. Thank you. Yeah, so, so the way that shows, so the way, you mean the plot that showed the, bac the bacteria are separate. They're actually together, they're the food. And so what happens, really happens, is you have free viruses, and we see those in the images because we're imaging it too. So you have free viruses, then after some period of time the viruses have to have a host. So they start attacking the bacteria. We think that might be playing a role in the bacteria even getting out. And so there's some synergy going on there. And the tricky part is we're counting these things. We're, count, we're doing stains and counting bacteria and viruses. The hard part is they have to be free from each other to count them. When they go together, you know, they don't really count. And so, I mean, they count, I guess at that point they start to count. Uh, depends on if they're alive or dead. Yeah, so it starts to get tricky when you start to get, because that's what happens through a bloom. Basically, you go from isolated systems like I described to everything is together. It starts to, it makes snow, which is where things get sticky and they get huge and that's what settles carbon out in the ocean. And we see that. And so the, the evolution goes from these externally mixed, very distinct microorganisms and particles to these clumped systems where everything has everything. Is kind of what it looks like. Just sure. Yeah. 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 They're, they're a prime suspect. Uh-huh. Yeah. We're, <laughs> we get, I, are, you a th are you a theorist? Okay, because we get asked this question. So we have, I forgot to mention, we have theorists in our center that are ask, asking that question every day, 10 times a day. Tell us what to put, tell us what to put at the surface. So, you know, sort of the standard answer is right now we're starting with, we see a lot of lipids, a lot of LP, lipopolysaccharides that, that go to the surface. So a lot of what we would say are more bacteria related compounds um, with salts. And so when you start doing that, you will, as people sort of shown in really simple systems, you start to see bays and things sort of separating into islands. And it's not this, the picture was that it would be this beautiful surfactant, right? SDS, that's the model system. But it, that's not what it looks like or acts like. And so we're trying to, as best we can, we're now using high resolution mass spec to go after what the classes of compounds are. And we're just, you know, we're just at the edge. It took us a while to get to the point of having a handle on the big picture. Now we're going into the microscopic details. But if you made me pick one, that'd get, and I think Vicki will talk about a couple of others in her talk. Any other questions? Okay, well thank you.